This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. Do not be afraid. We are now in control of what you hear. One, two, three, testing. A journey to the far reaches of knowledge and the unknown. I can't believe I just saw that. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups. One soul and preeminent power. From extraterrestrials to exposing the truth. I'll try to explain as much as I can. You're listening to Planet X. You're listening to Planet X. This is Planet X. Planet X. Broadcasting to you from the studios of Planet X, this is the Tony Topping Show. and welcome to the Tony Topping Show. We're back again. It's Tuesday. It's 8 p.m. It's Planet X. I've been down the lamb and flag. I've come back. And we've got Nigel Mortimer on the show. Nigel, who's going to give us an update on all his portal stuff and his excellent book that he's written and his public speaking. He was on the show a few months back. And this is part two, and I think he's had his computer hacked, and uh, I think there's all sorts to tell us. We've got an event coming up that he's roped us into, if I can yeah. get from the lamb and flag in time to settle. Uh, <laughs> and there we go. Good evening, <laughs> Nige. Hiya, Tony. How are you doing, I'm my all, friend? I'm all, I'm all right, mate. Yeah, well, hey, do you know, you can't beat... The way that you set people up to start this show is unbelievable. I don't, I don't You've lost your way, mate. Yeah, I've lost my way. Lost I'm way. waiting. I'm waiting for the big broadcasting deal, so you know, so I can <laughs> set myself up and then call myself an Illuminati broadcaster. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and give it the old eye symbol and uh, you know all that kind of jazz, mate. Is is what we're gonna do? It's, uh, well, I, I think you're in a prime position to actually be on this. Um, is it the the public voice or something? It's called oh, the, the David I, voice. Yeah, the well, people's voice. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah, the, yeah I can see you on there, and I think it's worked well. Yeah. It's, it's it's interesting to note that uh, you know more and more I uh, I see myself awakening with the world uh, with the world view around us. I mean Syria, I've never seen anything quite like it going on in Syria where they bomb the frigging place uh, right. in order to bring peace and freedom to the people. I find that very <laughs> sinister, very right. sinister in, indeed. And uh, also, what is sinister, of course, Nigel, is the targeting of researchers like ourselves who go down with illness, uh, who are absolutely mentally exhausted with our work, but still we still we trundle on against the court of public opinion that thinks we're absolutely mad uh you know and uh you've done uh, you've done lo loads of research and just to briefly bring the listeners up to date you wrote a book um called isaac newton and the, what is it the secret sun yeah the secret sundial the secret sundial and you wrote that and you've done all the research about freemasonry and settle and how it's covering up an esoteric uh, portal now if anybody thinks well nigel's talking out of his ass hat uh you need to look at the research of nick redfern he's only the research you would ever need and realize that the u.s military was also looking at this material in 1950 before the remote viewing programs of project stargate grill flame etc etc under, under the umbrella of something called the collins elite and they concluded roughly the same conclusion as I concluded before reading their info, probably as Nigel's concluded, and you've been followed by helicopters as well, Nigel, is that correct? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's all part of the course now, I mean, I've had the men in black experiences which um, I've recently described it's not actually in the book, this, but it's all part of, you know, my previous work to actually discovering the portal in Settle, Tony right. but, yeah I mean, as you know, this doesn't just start with the portal. You know, I explained to your listeners last time about how these things go back to basically when I was born in Germany in 1959. Um, uh, very strange things happening with my mother there, we, we, you know, which may be why, I don't know if this happened with you, Tony, but maybe why we're actually embroiled and involved in this subject, you know, whereas most normal people out there you know, look on it as being a bit crazy and, and way out. But yeah. it's always been part of my life, you know, that's been the thing. And I do think that it does connect heavily with the military. 
history. You know, yeah. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it definitely so. And I think you you had a you had an incident with the uh, with a helicopter, uh, didn't you, overlooking these uh, research areas, the the old green and marked helicopter, which yeah. I think is based up in uh, up at that certain place at Harrogate. I'm absolutely convinced they're coming out of there. Um, you know, definitely. and so you, you you know you you've been watched and, and all that kind of thing. So what you did is you wrote a book regarding the port regarding a portal. Can you describe to some of the listeners your version of a portal and what it means to you and how this all came about yeah i mean the portal idea has been around for years tony in that um you know ghost hunting and people that, that look into the spirit world will say that places that are in houses and windows into other dimension other worlds are portals now if you think about this scientifically, we're actually working on, on the presumption now that um, we live in a multidimensional reality, really. And if so, then there's going to be places where we can actually come in and out of these different realities in different dimensions. And I think that um, science, uh, what we call science, has known about this for hundreds of years, at least 400 years since the 1600s. Really? That, yeah, definitely. Look, just with, as a matter of interest, Nigel, uh, what, what research uh, round about that day have you been looking at then to, to confirm that all sounds very interesting what kind of stuff have you looked at to to confirm there been knowing about this from 1600 because uh, you wonder what you do is you actually underplay your esoteric knowledge which is quite vast especially in the area of words and what things truly mean so do anyway do carry on tell, no, tell no, yeah you did right there um, as you know the title of the book is sir isaac newton and the secret sundial yes. and people have asked me well why would you connect isaac newton with yeah. you know this portal ufos and this sort of thing well yeah. the very fact remains is that and this was an amazing thing which you'll know that came up in the book was during during my research yes. and uh, I'm always open to influences, Tony. You know, yes. although I do do the historic research in the area to back up my claims, I am always open to channeling information through that may come from elsewhere. And I do believe that I am helped in that way. And one of these instances was that I was led uh, by following energy lines in the settle area where this portal is to a place called Landcliffe. And lo and behold, to cut a long story short, I mean, people can read about this in the book, and it's all backed up again by good, firm evidence, is that Sir Isaac Newton in his Cambridge years when he was doing all this, you know, top class uh, new science into uh, gravity and, and how light refracts and things like that. All these new brilliant ideas that he brought forward was actually staying in Landcliffe. And there's, there's even an arbor there today that's been kept. That's a sort of an enclosure in the garden where the, there's trees around the seat where Isaac Newton was supposed to have sat and pondered about all these ideas. Now, what I found really strange was that we're only hundreds of yards away from this portal. Can you imagine it back there in the 1600s? Isaac Newton sat there under this apple tree type thing, which he does the legend of the apple tree does come up in, in his hometown, of course. But there is the one there in the arbor. He sat there looking at this portal area and all of a sudden, all of these ideas about how the universe works how gravity comes into being and that comes to him basically I mean you can look at the research and see that the ideas weren't there in his head before he came to the portal area now my question and I ask this Tony is it just that he learned this stuff or is it that just as we get new information centres on this channeling level, was it imparted into him while he was in the portal area And what is? I mean that sounds amazingly outlandish to say that but it's pretty. I'm pretty sure that this event did happen. In that, uh, when you look at the, the way that Isaac Newton, um, he had a private life, as most people researchers know today, into alchemy and into the esoteric sciences, as you mentioned earlier. And one of the main things he was really interested in was King Solomon's Temple. Now. The way that he looked at this was from May, very may I just come in there, Nigel? Yeah, yeah, uh, no, uh, rabbit, not See if I can just... No, not at all. Uh, no, I let, no, 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 you're not rubbing it on. You're fascinated. Um, just see, let, let me see if I can understand you. Could you just explain to the listeners what the esoteric significance is of King Solomon Temple? Yeah. Well, as far as the portals go, um, I'm a firm believer, and again, this is what... what you need to look at the biblical references. You need to look at the historical evidence of um, the, the Temple of Jerusalem and how it was built. There is one line that has always stuck in my mind, and that was that this place, whatever it was, where the Temple of Jerusalem, King Solomon's original temple was built, was built by no human hands. Wow. Now, this is... Now, this is interesting that they should bring that up. And I don't think literally that we've got alien beings there building this. You know, that that's just too, too silly to comprehend. But I do believe that there is something in that sentence that is saying to us, look, you need to look further into this. There's a connection between humanity and something else at uh, this particular site. And where the, the building of the temple is, remember, what was housed in that, that Temple of Solomon? 
the Ark of the Covenant. What is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, in a modern scientific way, you'd say it's some sort of communication device, certainly between another reality, another dimension, and our own. And I do believe that this is what, what we're looking at there, is that there's been a hidden secret for many generations, passed through the Templars, that, who, who obviously, you know, worked in that area of the Temple of Solomon, uh, right through to the Freemasons of modern day today that know this secret, that... We're not alone. You know, we are dealing with other entities that can be used for bad or good, for power or neglect, and and that's what's going on. I'm afraid we're getting we're getting uh, the powers and the authorities within the world that know about portals and know that um, you know maybe it's not so much that with the human race in decline that we need to leave this planet in rocket ships. Maybe we just need to take a step sideways and be in another reality, oh, and that so could be. Yeah, that could be an amazing secret that would be worth keeping. To. Uh, 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 well, a question I'd, I'd like to ask you, uh, Nigel, is uh, on uh, in, on vigilant uh, vigilant citizen. Uh, it reports that there's um, a actual um, what was it now? A pentagram. Google Earth discovered yeah. uh, over Russia, over Kazakhstan, a uh, a pentagram, massive, great big thing in Kazakhstan, in the Kazakhstan area. I, I'm interested to to ask you: Have you done anything like that with with Google Earth and all that kind of thing, and seen any symbolism in the in the area from overhead, from from above, kind of thing? Anything odd? Yeah, I mean, this is the amazing thing is that when you look at that, I've seen what you're referencing there, Tony, myself, and I mean, it's just an amazing area. I mean, um, you know, to, for somebody to lay that down, it reminds you of the Nazca Lines, that type of thing on the scale of it. But yeah. it's, yeah, yeah, and it's obviously... Um, some people will look at that and see the connotations between occultism and, you know, that symbol. But you've got to really do the research. And we found that exactly the same here. Although we didn't find things of that nature in the landscape, you know, pentagrams and things, we do find energy lines that connect up to ancient sites that would form that type of um, symbolism. And I think it's really important you brought that up, Tony, because it is the key. Anybody that studies this, uh, you, you might want to call it occultism or, uh, you know, uh, that type of thing. We'll, we'll know that down the generations, the pentagram, the pentacle, all mm. these sort of five-sided mm. um, geometric uh, shapes mm. are very entwined mm -hmm. within the secret, you know, even in Freemasonry, within the secrets or symbolism of what mm. is going on here. Mm -hmm. um, even mm -hmm. at the folly, we've got, you know, which I mentioned in my book, again, found, this has been known to historians, but not looked at that in the, the right way. The folly is the building that hides the actual portal area on the hillside mm -hmm. of Temple. Well, even on the doorway there, we have what people would call a, a carving of the flower of life, which basically is made up of a pentacle, you know. Mm -hmm. So so it's the same thing going on and on again. What, what these shapes are showing is that, and I would imagine on that particular island you mentioned there, is that that is a gateway, a doorway into a particular, you know, dimension of one kind or another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yes, I, 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 I get you on on, on that one. Um, speaking of, of of esoteric, Nigel, what what do you think of the uh, of the mainstream media? Do, I'm just uh, asking your random thoughts on this. Um, in that, uh, you're go if you went on the mainstream media, you're going to have some smart ass uh, media presenter um, turn around to you and go, "Well, Nigel, this is all hocus pocus." While at the same time. And this is no criticism of them, uh, but I'd like your thoughts on on all this. Uh, while at the same time he has one trouser leg rolled up, uh, his chest bared, <laughs> uh, and he's lowered back and born again, say no more, say no more, uh, in an esoteric seminary. While at the same time turning around to you and telling you you're nuts. How does how how does that work with you in the grand scheme of things? Right. Well, that's happened to me literally, you know, shortly in the aftermath of uh, publishing the book here in the place where the portal is. Right. Um, and, and it's funny how you brought this up because uh, um, just before I came on the interview, I was talking to a person, I can't mention names, obviously, it's a private matter, but who has told me without a shadow of a doubt that she has information that shows that one of the local councillors is, to put it is bluntly, in other words, is you've ruffled his feathers with what you've written about. And right. basically, he is a Freemason. I know the person person she's talking about, and he is one of the local Freemasons. Mm -hmm. Now, yeah, yeah, to the general public out there and, and the way that the media would present all of this, um, it, it would be, you know, just say the biggest joke. This sort of thing that you probably find them, you know, putting out on April Fool's Day. So, yeah, I can understand that, and, and most of the public that would say, you know, without looking at the... Uh, research without looking at the historic evidence and without looking at how things are happening in other places that, that you know this is just not one portal there are portals all over the world that seem to operate and be hidden in a similar way so that's what i'd do is i'd present the evidence 
Tony. You know, that's what we've got to look at. It's no good just, you know, we that's why I, really, um, this leads me on to another thing that we need to look at, and that's progression of this subject that we're involved in, Tony, because you've seen it down the years, how, you know, it's in the 80s, ufology was quite happy to take quite a lot of, you know, going into UFOs now, quite a lot of um, sightings and reports and just lock them away. You know, yes, it was a red object at 200 feet and it made a buzzing noise. That categorises as that CE1, CE2. It went on like that for years and years and years, but I took that step, and I know you have too, of, of saying, hang on a minute, we can do that forever, but we're not going to actually get anywhere. We're just going to have lots and lots of information of the same kind that doesn't really show us the full picture. And I stepped out of that arena back in the late 1980s to actually want to personally say, well, we've got all this, you know, there's enough evidence here to say something is going on. We didn't know what it was, but surely we can take that further. And that's why I dared to look at channeling, to look at, you know, these portal sites, to look at ancient sites, how they connect with, with the modern phenomena and look at history and look at all these different avenues and there's there's almost like I feel a time now that we need to shift into not ufology anymore but new N-E-W newfology. We need to walk into another area just like the portals have shown us let's go sideways with this information and let's you know say well you know, if channeling is connected with all of this, if people are saying that they're having entities come in their bedroom and they're imparting knowledge, let's not just lock that, let's work with it. Let's actually find out what is <coughs> going on here once and for all, Tony. The, the trouble, I think that the problem with that as well, Nigel, is, is the fact that they uh, they don't actually do you any favours, these uh, these things that are going on. They, 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 they've, they've not done me, for example, last week or the week before, uh, on three consecutive evenings, UFOs came over my house uh there wasn't a jet in sight intercepting them uh probably because the raf aren't daft uh they just le left them to it so they're flying around the ruddy house uh, flying up and above the garden in the same pattern which seems to be the configuration of a key but yeah. i'm probably reading into that so what you would then do is you would say ah they're flying across in a key formation my god this is a tremendous esoteric secret uh, when when they flew over wanting to be filmed by, by illuminating themselves they didn't even realise my camera wasn't working so <laughs> it, you know they, they, they're prone to mistakes so um, it, it just it's just all a bit odd that, they, that that's all they did they, they fly over the house and, and give it the flashing light routine uh, and that's about it there's nothing really um earth shattering well maybe there is if somebody here does talking though they'd think my god that is freaky they'd, they'd probably think it's mind blowing but what i'm saying is they don't seem to be doing doing us any a, a, me personally any favors whatsoever no your uh, case tony i understand what you're saying there i hmm. do i really do i appreciate it and going back a number of years th that was happening with me exactly the same and it becomes yes. quite frustrating in a way because just like I mentioned about logging all the sightings, it's almost like a repeater fashion of the same thing yes. going over and over and over. Well, yes. let me just explain something to you where it's our perception of this, really, that is limited. And I'm not trying to say that you don't know this yourself, I'm sure. How you dare don't. you, Mortimer? How <laughs> exactly. dare you accuse me of not knowing anything? <laughs> 30 years' experience and you, you from Settle, are accusing me of not knowing what I'm talking about. On, well, do you know, I would never dare do that, Tony. <laughs> It's a lot easier that you're not in the room. I can ask. No, tell you, you do understand what I'm getting out there. It's yeah, that. I do, like, listen, I don't know what's going on half the time, and I'm actually supposed to be. You know, well, some people say I'm not at all, but I feel that I'm in, ch in, in channeling a being that gives me information about this. But what I'm trying to say is, Tony, is that let me give you an example. We all know about the uh, the Whitley Striber, you know, Striber uh, communion episode. You know that that classic uh, yes. encounter that happened in America. Now. What people don't know, because I was around at that time, is about the person himself. We all know about what happened to him and, and what he was involved in with the yeah. greys and this, yeah. that and the other. But do you know, do how many people out there that are listening to me know about the person? And Whitley Schreiber is, has that not actually come forward with this, but... You know, the information is there for you to actually research. Yes. And that's uh, before he had his encounters, Whitley Strieber was actually well known as a, a, a horror, you know, fiction yes. writer. Yes. It, you know, quite up there with, with some of the big, you know, Stephen Kings and all these sort of people and that. Now, he was very egotistic as a person. Yes. You know, the, the fame went to his head, we should say. And through that, when you read, he, he admits, you know, he neglected his family quite a lot, his young son mm -hmm. and his wife. Yeah, all he was bothered about was fame, fortune, and right. getting his name out there. The rest of it had to just follow him, yeah? Yeah, right. yeah. So, all of a sudden then, things change. He has this encounter with the Greys. 
you've got to think about what happened to him. And the, the most horrific thing that can happen to any person, he claims happened to him, was that these beings mm -hmm. came, took him from his own home, security mm -hmm. of his own home, and actually raped him. Okay, mm -hmm. in one shape mm -hmm. or another, mm -hmm. and there were physical traces there of this happening, so it seemed like a real event to him. Blah blah blah. Now, if you look at that, what they actually did, Tony, and this is what's going on when we have these things happen that we don't quite understand, is that they took him. Yes, they they, they showed that you know we think we're so important as people, but really anything can happen to us at any time. Mm -hmm. And when you when you actually <laughs> think you've been raped, should mm -hmm. I say, you are actually taken to the very base root of yourself again. Mm -hmm. Your esteem is completely gone. And what they were doing there in their own sort of like almost magical way was making Whitley Schreiber see as a person, because he had a potential, remember what he's brought out since. Mm -hmm. He's moved on ufology leaps and bounds. But what they showed him was his potential was within himself, that he had to lose all the ego, he had to lose all of that, his self-esteem and things, and become nothing again. And it was only when he became nothing through that process... Um, that he was able then to actually look at, you know, things a lot deeper and find out more things about what, what really are going on in this mysterious universe and in life. And, and people will say he changed, mm. he changed dramatically. So mm. what I'm trying to get at is, although we see light, lights in the sky fly across the Tony and things, there could be something going on with you at a much deeper level. Yeah, there is, mate, yeah. Do you yeah, understand what yeah, I'm getting no, at no, there? That's absolutely, absolutely true. Yeah. Uh, if you remove me saying, uh, oh, I don't know why they've flown over, if you remove that part of myself that is saying that uh, the other component of it it's like the left hand doesn't know what the right yes, hand is saying exactly. so, you know the left hand department has just spoken and said well I don't know why they're here blah 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 but the right hand department is fully aware of what they're uh, exactly. of, you know, of, what they, of what they're doing and why they are uh, and why they're here and I, I do think that there is a warning uh, they, they keep persistently uh, warning uh, I, I think that I think that they came over intentionally, and uh, I do think that they've been seen by military uh, military satellites from above. They, they certainly were making their yeah. present self for three nights continually. Yeah. Uh, you know, and there's a reason. That there's obviously a reason behind that. I don't know whether you saw the recent reports in Syria from Syria, Nigel, regarding UFOs going over Syria. I did. Uh, yeah, yeah. You've seen you've seen that one, and some people say it's a fake, and and, and so on and so forth. And what listeners might um, might be interested in, and I don't know what to make of it at all. Uh, uh, they've said he's a fraud, etc. Et but a, a, a guy, there's a guy out there in, a, in America who, who, who's indicating that he's in the position of being uh, part of the Majestic uh, organisation, Majestic 12. Right. Uh, and what he's indicated is that he's, he's gone to find out information as to if they have a file on me. Uh, under when he was serving under Admiral, I think it's McConnell, uh, right. and and what's happened is is that he's he's uh, he's turned around and said uh, that there is some information. Could I ring him? And then uh, next minute, I know I get an email from his. Uh, secretary or assistant saying no don't do that he's involved with stuff going on in uh, in Syria uh, just uh, he can't uh, just don't ring him because he's absolutely up to his neck in it uh, with, wow. uh, he's, got, he's got operatives on the ground uh, this that and the other and you're thinking why the bloody hell would somebody like Majestic <laughs> have operatives on the ground and then you see the UFOs over Syria yeah. uh, and then you have uh, one of Whitley's interesting books uh, and I've forgotten the title of it it escapes me explain um, about a rogue element of the government in America that is uh, piloting um, triangle craft. Exactly. Advanced triangle yeah. craft. Yeah. And then you see over Syria, and I don't think it was CGI, they're all running for cover, these freedom fighters. This bloody yeah. thing, this triangle, comes flying at speed over this highway. Um, so there's obviously some classified craft knocking about in, um, in Syria at the moment, which is very... Um, I don't know, Nigel. I just no, I, that, that's you're dead right. Um, you know, I've seen that, and, and what, what I do see is a pattern emerging, and which I'm sure you do as well, Tony, yeah, and some yeah. of the listeners. Is that wherever we seem to get these focus of the world's attention yeah, on any particular part of the globe, whether yeah. it be in Syria, Turkey, do you remember the, the, the great classic footage from Turkey that came yeah. out there? Yeah. yeah, or these other places where there are wars going on in Iraq, but also where there's been disasters like you know there's been UFO sightings in Japan and, and all these other yeah. places when we have the tsunami. There seems to be a focus. It's almost like, you know, um, are, are they doing something there? You know, yes. do they feed off the fear in those places? There are many open questions why UFOs would be there. Yes. But, but it does seem from just on, on uh, you know, an open level, really, of looking at that is that they are attracted to the world's focus and attention, you know, well, definitely. It, it certainly seems that way, Nigel. It certainly seems that these uh, these objects... I hasten to add, by the way, those remarks I've made regarding Majestic and blah, 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 
I keep an open mind because I've no idea whether the guy is true. So, you uh, know, look, look, just to say to the listeners, we, I do not be- believe any old shit, and please don't right. take my court jester, easygoing manner uh, for being a person who, I think listeners know me well enough to know that, for being <laughs> a person who believes anything that's thrown at him. Uh, but, but yeah, and so uh, we, we are seeing this, and we're seeing a monitoring by these uh, ETs, I do believe, of world affairs. Uh, I do believe that there are certain countries that are what they, they are watching, um, and I don't know what you think, Nigel, but I, I believe that uh, certain elements of the U.S. government, perhaps uh, even the British government, are speaking to them. Uh, yeah. What would you say to that? Yeah, I mean, this goes back to your question about what you saw in the sky overflying your house, Tony. Yes. Yeah. Um, um, the, the problem is we can't just say the ETs. No, we can't. You right know, now. are we talking about which ETs? Are we talking about yeah. hybrids between human yeah. and ETs? Oh, you know, yeah. so many. You know, and again, it's all, all yeah. question marks, question marks. Advanced, advanced drone craft? It could be advanced drone exactly, craft. Exactly, exactly. You know, you know. It could be just, I mean, we just had recently, last week, I had a report given to me of a lady who's, who's interested in the portal, but she said, do you know what? She said, I was open-minded about this until my son, last week, he came forward and he said he stopped on the bypass at Settle because he couldn't believe there was a 40-foot triangular black object hovering over his car. You're uh, shitting me. No, really? no. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's triangu- triangular craft. And other cars were slowing down to look at it. So it's obviously a you know, physical object there. Well, did, have mean, you seen it, Nigel? Sorry, have you seen this then? I've, I've never seen a, a triangular UFO. Are, are uh, you aware but, of their presence? Have, they, have they commu- the people behind it communicated with you then, or do you think? Uh, I was... Um, this is my view on through channeling, but again, you know, I mean, people that take channeling as, as evidence, uh, you know, they're going to they're gonna have a field day with this. But I'll tell you exactly why I know through my guide about the train, because right. obviously the subject has come up. Right, right. I think that we're talking about crafters got technology within it, right? You know, they say that it's been sort of from, uh, how can I put it? It's got bio engineered i would say is the best way to put it Bio- bioengineered bio-engineer. yeah, yeah yeah but if i would tell you the country where these are actually originating from you would laugh but this is i can only go with the information that i'm actually channeled to mate right go on then go and on, this I'll... would open up a heck of a lot of you would think well that is an impossibility because you know this country isn't particularly powerful or anything like that but it may be that they're not actually <laughs> the people that run that country are not behind them but it's definitely where they're based are, and that's norway Ooh, okay, that, I don't, that I... wouldn't be that would not be as daft as it looks. And dear listeners, may I tell you as well that Nigel at a probe conference uh, he channels this. I keep an open mind on it, and he channels this uh, entity called uh, Sharlik, and he predicted the Polish air crash, um, he, 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 which which astounded me actually. A few months later, the tragedy happened, uh, and uh, his guide actually channeled this, um, which is interesting. But no. Um, I would say Norway, and I would also say the Pacific and Indian Ocean. Uh, I've definitely said on camera that a UFO that came in over my home and illuminated a TV antenna was from the Pacific Ocean area, uh, yeah. from a base out there. And um, they're there, they're here. If you go to Peru or India, they're down the bloody road, aren't they? When you brought up India last time as well, Tony, that amazed me, because you were actually, yeah. I don't know if you, you, you've talked to people in that country and experts that are, are telling you all this information about India, but it's so, um, from my point of view, with my channel, you know I've done heck of a lot of work on Ilkley Moor, which is a million miles away yeah. from India, but we yeah. have one of the, the most enigmatic carved symbols. Yeah. They can't actually, they, they did try to date it to the Bronze Era, called the Swastika Stone, yeah. but, but it actually predates wow. that now. They, they right. don't know when it was carved, basically, because what the strange thing is that that particular rock outcrop that it's carved onto was 200 foot below sea level when it was carved. Mm. So we're going back to well, an era that, well, you know, predates human civilization. That, that, that's, that, that, <laughs> is in, uh, that is incredible. And, and not only that, Nigel, but um, uh, you say, I'm very intrigued with this remark, you said that they're coming out of Norway. Is that from a fjord in Norway? Exactly. Uh, that's yeah, the word yeah. I was going to, yeah. Yeah. Look forward to you, the yeah. blonde, blonde, the, the blonde oriental looking type, do you think? Or, the Nordics, uh, the Nordics, the Nordics yeah. 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 Uh, what were they called, the Nordics, in the 60s? Um, Space Brothers, that type of blonde, yeah, type of being. Yeah. But but again, a lot of those take on a human, um, it's hard to explain, they're not holograms, but they take on a human essence really yes, they, they don't do. look like that no, uh, uh, no. in their energy you know they're completely different yeah. but because of the time period that most of them came through in the 60s 50s 60s um i'm not going to sort of decry our, our limitations of human awareness but people weren't quite as smart as they are today no but it's uh, true you know, and they have to they have to appreciate them in a certain type of way, just as they do today. Yeah, no, no. Yeah, yeah. So they were presented in that particular type of form 
which would be much user friendlier and much more peaceful looking and that you know so um but this is again it's all channel information uh, uh, it's not um information that you could learn anywhere it's hard to say that. I shouldn't say that, really, because there are other people that get information channeled even from my guide, you know, in different parts of the world. So there are places where that information is available, you know, as well as myself. But what I'm trying to say is it's not a learned um, knowledge, really. Did you say, Nigel, that, that from that channeling that, they, that, that they've been around since 1960? Well, before that, actually. Yeah, yeah before, it, was, it was before that. But it's interesting you should say that because during the course of my experiences with them, which I don't actually go into great detail about, right. uh, they said that they were around in 1960 and that the British government were fully aware of them in the 1960s. But oddly yeah. enough, uh, the uh, Credo Mutwa, the Zulu um, yeah. Zulu shaman, uh, indicates that the Zulu, the term for Western European male, was Zugu, does not, does not mean Western European male at all, it means children of the stardust, wow. children of the dust and refers to uh, blonde Nordics who visited them before they'd even seen the western European man. That's right, there, there yeah. are historical records from that the historical part of the world. Records, yes, there, there are, are. there are drawings of white faced, you know yes. uh, beings yeah. and people, yeah definitely yeah, they are, and I think what is very interesting further about that is the think tank that was spewing information um, into, into the Indian media here, there and everywhere about various, about its thoughts on the on UFOs, uh, which would further listener that further listeners' uh, interest yeah. uh, would indicate that there's uh, that there's definitely something going on in the Andromeda galaxy. Oh yeah, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and and the gal- the thing with that is anything to do with uh, UFOs and anything to do with that from the Andromeda uh, region is actually not present. Went dry. The trail went dry. There was nothing on this. There was nothing within the Indian media. It was removed from its service. There was an article right. to do with UFOs and aliens from Andromeda. An article. Uh, it was in a, on an Indian press website. It was removed, uh, and that's probably because that's probably where they're coming from. Uh, they keep they, they keep coming in from that from that region of the uh, of the galaxy. Now you might think, well, that's a bit far fetched. Uh, this is absolute BS. How, how could you say that? But it isn't really, Nigel. When you can send an email to somebody in a millisecond, can't you? <laughs> exactly. I mean, this is the whole thing, isn't it? That we've got to really take a grasp of our own ego, Tony, and yeah. realize where we are. Yeah. We think it's amazing to send that email in in millisecond seconds yeah. right it is amazing yeah. just think what we're better doing in 100 years time because yeah. it's only 100 years ago tony that our best form of transport was a horse and car well frankly nigel i think in 100 it's years from now we'll be running to nuclear shelters it's going to happen i think well, we're going to have riots in the streets unless we unless we change our act unless and that probably goes for me and everyone really unless we unless we change our course and direction uh, but i see and i don't know what you think nigel but it's happened to you the listeners might not know but that, that there are malevolent forces is out there uh, at work in our society, undermining uh, undermining everything that Britain or even America stands for very slowly. I don't know what your thoughts are on that, but you had a you had an incident, didn't you, where you were kind of like attacked and you were made ill. And I think the listeners would like to hear. Yeah, that. I mean, I have explained that to you before, and I mean, to be honest with you, even today, it's a couple of years since that happened. I'm still sort of getting over it, Tony. Yeah. You know, it, it was a thing that shocked me more than the illness affecting me physically. Yeah. It shocked me how the way that that could come into being, and I will explain to you. But we have to be careful because, <laughs> funnily enough, after I last mentioned this, um, I don't know who listens to your show or whether there's people, you know, that, with the NSA revelations that are coming out, maybe everything's being digested by the powers that be. We don't know. But I did certainly find that I almost had, which I know you'll understand, Tony, and people that are involved in the subject, almost like a, a radiation effect yes. uh, affecting me, making me feel unwell. And that was after I explained about what happened to me. Yeah. Almost like it had... Yeah, do you understand what I'm getting? I do, mate. And the thing is, I I think what listeners won't realise, or perhaps might realise, but they don't realise, and you know, although the mainstream media has actually been very good to me, uh, actually, it's the alternative media hasn't done, but they they don't realise the level of danger involved in our work. When these bloody things fly over... Uh, mm-hmm. There's always a, you're always thinking are they a bit close because they'll be emitting radiation of some level and you're thinking to yourself are they uh, are they a bit too close for comfort I've I've had them come in very near before now yeah 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 you yeah. Know, and, it, and you're always putting yourself at, at bloody at bloody risk and you know what I don't know what you think Nigel but me being the compassionate soul that I am I <laughs> always worry when these helicopters are kind of like in the fields and they've got these little dot of light thing following and you're thinking. You're thinking, oh, my days, I hope the pilot's all right, because you know what they can do. Don't, you know what I'm saying? 
I do exactly. You, you yeah, know, you, you know what they can, uh, you, you know what they're capable of, and and I think what happened to you, it was a, it was an entity. The story goes, wasn't it, that presented itself to you um, within the portal. Yeah, well, what they do is um, good or bad entities can work with you. Right. I work with a guide who's a good entity. Yeah, yeah? Right. just like there are people on this planet good. Planet. So you're going to get bad entities that have an agenda, yes. just like we do. Yeah. You know, just because they're advanced, it doesn't mean that they don't leave their no. particular egos behind. You know, and their agendas. Now the thing is that shortly after finding where the portal vortex, where things can come in and out of this reality was, yeah. uh, or in Settle, um, I was actually up there working there to try and bring through, the, you know, to help bring through. Right. So it's all about building up energy really, and building up uh, a gateway really for these good entities to come through and influence our world. Right. Now we were working on that with my wife, and then suddenly I because my focus, they're very good, these entities, on tapping into our mind consciousness, and finding out what we already know about, and what what they do then is the, they'll work on that to actually project themselves or influence you with knowledge or whatever. And what this particular entity did was he pretended because I was looking at the 1600 period, again with the Isaac Newton information and things, um, and the cover up that happened then about the portal, to actually extract that information from me and act as if he was a character from that time period. He actually presented himself to me in energy form in front of me um, oh. as this yeah, as this sort of, he formed um, like a ghostly apparition would, he formed to look like a, I would mm. say like a local yokel, <laughs> if you understand what I mean, like a, a little old Yorkshireman, but he, he seemed sort of one of the gentry, he had like a, a neckerchief thing. Oh, I'm going to be a bit smart here, Nigel, and go, surely yeah. Nigel, did you have your eyes closed? You must have, had, that's your mind, that's your imagination seeing that, did you have your eyes closed? Didn't have my eyes closed, no. Wow. Um, it's very difficult because again, you, you know, that it's got it's a thing where um, I have had witnesses with me in the past when these apparitions have appeared. Uh -huh. um, an example, I was with a partner in Scotland when what we call the Blue Lady, who's a, a blue Andromedan entity. Funnily enough, you mentioned them, who comes through and she helps me now and again. I've had other people see her appear. She looks like the Virgin Mary and she floats through the woodlands. So these things can. What it is it's all to do with energy, just like we're energy, Tony. They, right. they can actually use that to manifest. Right. So I didn't have my eyes closed. No, I actually watched them. In fact. I watched him so much that he started um, doing this almost like a little, um, it sounds comical to talk to you now, but at the time it's quite frightening, like a little jig, like a little dance around me, so I had to keep turning round. That's so it the conscious mind is actually occupied, isn't it? You're in a trance with them, aren't you? Exactly, mm. exactly. Mm. They're taking you into their reality, mm. but but you are fully aware of what's going on around you. Mm. Right. And again, what, what this entity did was, um, I, at first, I mean, you can only take things on face value, remember, we're all fallible in that way. So I took him as we were, and I thought he was going to help me. I thought, oh, this guy's come through, he's from that period, he's going to help me to find out more information on the portal. And he started to say things like, he was very jolly, very nice, and he started to talk in this sort of like, definitely from that time period, his language, but very Yorkshire, very broad. And he said to me, yeah, you know, you're really wasting your time here, my friend. He said, there's nothing here. He said, it's just all a, a joke, you know, there was never a portal here. Yeah. There were never any standing stones on this hill. You've got it all wrong. People have just made all this up to waste your time. And he was saying, you'd be better off leaving it alone. Don't bother with it anymore. Um, he said, you know, but but he could tell that in my mind that, you know, it'd take a million of those um, apparitions to convince me there were nothing there. And he could tell this frustration started to show then. And his energy started changing. You can feel these energies totally change. Uh, before the apparition changes. And all of a sudden, he went very dark. The outline of his whole body changed and sort of blended in with the natural landscape around me. Bloody but then, hell. yeah, it almost became like a black shadow in a way. Good but his God. form was still there, oh, right? Yeah. Very frightening, yeah. Quite, even though I'm involved in this, it's frightening when these things happen. Yeah, yeah, right? of course, yeah. of course. And, 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 but, uh, go on, carry on, Nigel, I'm all Yeah, but more so, Tony, was his tone of voice, right? Mm. It was now aggressive. Uh -huh. It suddenly changed an instant to aggressive. He said, look, he says, I've told you, stop it. He said, if you don't stop it, I'll curse you. And then I was thinking, well, maybe it's from that time and they believe in curses and things. But then he came out with these key words which struck home with me straight away and I thought, hey, oh, um, I better be careful here because whatever this thing is, he's certainly not the spirit of somebody from the 1600s. He turned around and he said, uh, you, my friend, will malfunction. Now, that word... I've looked it up in dictionaries and everywhere. Malfunction wasn't around before the sort of 1920s. So the 1600s way out. So, so that, that 
shows me that in that instance that this entity, whatever it was, was certainly not human. And it was aware of me there and it and what it did was I don't think I don't believe in anybody, any human being able to curse anybody, Tony, yeah. unless you take that curse on board and your mind plays tricks with you and you can become ill that way. Yes. Almost like hypnosis, yeah? Yes. Yeah. But I'm not silly. I mean, even though he said that, after, you know, I said to Helen, my wife afterwards, he's cursed me, but, you know, I've got Charlotte working with me. He won't get through that. Blah, blah, blah. I felt well protected, didn't think of it. Within two months, I was walking around Settle, gasping for breath. I would go out in an evening. I couldn't breathe. It was like my lungs had collapsed. I was going to the doctors. I was rushed to Airedale Hospital in Skipton twice in the early hours of the morning to be resuscitated. Um... And, and, and I contracted this illness. Now, the thing was, it all worked out that it was um, quite a natural, you know, although I say natural, it was an illness that was only sort of found in the 1980s, quite a modern illness that I happened to get from God knows where. And it actually is more prevalent in southern Africa through the tribes and things have it a lot there from drinking contaminated water. Now, was it something that got in the water and settled that I drank? Why was my wife not affected? Why was it only me? So you can see there's something very odd had gone on there. Now, I don't think I was cursed. What I think was this entity had extracted from my mind and from the future events in my life this is... something that would happen to me anyway. Yes, I get you, Nigel. Do you, do you think it's because um, you're very powerful? Because you're never targeted <laughs> because you're weak by them. You're never hit because you're weak. You're always hit because you're strong. Uh, so it's never because you're weak. You, you know, it's the the inner the inner the inner psychic strength. You're always hit because yeah, you're, yeah, you're yeah. powerful. Um, it's not about powerful in that you can no, it's not, I know exactly no, what no, you're getting at. It's, it's not because that, you've no. got wisdom. Yeah, yeah. It's it's, it's not intellect. No, no. You know that, that intellect doesn't come into no, it. It's not, the, no. the, these forces that be would let you. That's what I'm trying to say. Really, you're connecting it in a really good way there, Tony. Who I was talking about with. The, the old ufology. Yeah. We can, with our intellect, collect cases after years, after years, after years, who will get us nowhere. Yeah. What we've got to learn to do as human beings is put some wisdom into that. Yes, yes, yeah, that, yeah. that is absolutely And that's correct. what they fear. They fear that we know how to use information. Yes, yes, that, that this is absolutely true. What, what, is, what is puzzling to me, Nigel, is the, uh, is the fact that during the course of my experiences, I was shown uh, what, we, what we had forgotten in terms of mind state, in terms of what we are connected to. Uh, and yeah. interesting Interestingly enough, from my research, once again back to India, the, uh, this mysterious leaks into the Indian media uh, regarding the fact that they had concluded and had put a lot of thought into it as well, that we, we are an aspect of something they termed a Type 5 in, intelligence. They, they, they had a classification, did, this, did these bizarre press releases in the Indian media of a classification of Type, type 0, which is us, but then it went as far as a Type 5, which is right. kind of like uh, we are like being projected from this vast intelligence that we would call a type 5 and we have that essence within us uh, and that is why some of us I think I think a type 5 or some aspect of that intelligence leaves its calling card in us uh, hence us yeah. getting all the all the grief and UFOs and everything like that. Now, now, interestingly enough, the solar mm. disk and, and all that kind of thing, what we see in the Egyptian paintings, uh, is reflective of this of this mindset of the cosmic consciousness. What yeah. what the question I'm putting to you, Nigel? I don't know what you think about this. Is what they have gone to? They uh, we'll call them. I don't know the Illuminati, the darker forces, whatever you want to call. Them. They've gone to a considerable uh, amount of trouble and time to. Um, make sure we forget who we are spiritually. <laughs> a lot of yes. time and trouble. And it's complex as well. Oh, yeah. It's, it's been going on for, for eons. Yeah. You know, it's been going on since the very earliest times that, that humanity realised it wasn't alone here on this planet. Yeah. There have been those that have taken that sort of baton and said, look, we know about this knowledge that, you know, that the, the masses don't know about. And we'll keep hold of that um, at all costs, basically. And that's what's still going on to this day in lots of different avenues. You know, uh, I mean, let me explain to you about you mentioned about India there, Tony, and its connections with um, I mentioned the swastika stone. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how all this is sort of laying out as I know in my mind, but it's been exemplified, mm -hmm. you know, at the moment in this conversation now. Most people will connect the swastika symbol with the Nazi Germany, even today, you know. When I go to talks, they always come up with, uh, even though a lot of more people are learning about where it actually goes back to Sanskrit, it goes back to ancient India and all this sort of thing, and Hinduism, and predates that. It's a pagan symbol of the solar wheel, as you mentioned. Now, they're still connected with the Nazis and that, but, but in a sense, that is correct, in that 
we talk about, you know, I can connect a lot of things we've talked about today from my perception of some of these entities that are originating in Norway. You know, there's a big connection there with what the Nazis were trying to do with the entities in Norway. We've got the UFO connection with the Nazis and, and Antarctica and actually India. You know, the, the actual Aryan race was supposed to have descended from the Indian yeah, peninsula. Yes, you know, yes. so there's a heck of a lot of things there that are connecting everything together. And I'm sure once we get all the jigsaw pieces, you know, we're going to see exactly what is going oh, on. Indeed. And that, yeah, that is what these people, the Illuminati and the people, the power brokers, the people that are at the top of the pyramid, are worried about, uh, more so in this day and age, things are really speeding up with the internet, is that, is that people are putting the jigsaw together. And once you've done that, Tony, you become free. Yes. And that, that is the problem. They're scared of freedom. Yeah. Yeah. And control. Yeah. The control is, you know, slipping out of their hands. Yes, this is, this is absolutely correct, and, and we see this I mean, all the time. Don't we? Let me ask you a question there, Tony, if you can do, about, you know, when you were on the, uh, the This Morning show recently, yes. uh, and with our great friend, Dr. Chris French. Yes. You know, I've yeah. met Chris in the past and that. But why I saw the difference with you there was an amazing thing that shows that we're moving out of ufology into ufology, as I call it now, is the way that you reacted on that show. If I'd have been on that show, let's go back 10 years ago, you know, 15 years ago, with, say, somebody like, and I'm sure you won't mind me saying this, because he's one of the old school, with Philip Mantle, for example, mm -hmm. done many similar TV programs, but we wouldn't have been aware enough... Mm -hmm. Right, seriously, and that's all it takes to, to go on that program and do exactly what you did, which was an amazing step forward, but would have been quite natural to you, I'm sure, where you turned the tables around on Chris French by, I mean, we just sat there, everybody did, and when you were saying things like to him, you know what, Chris, I didn't know you was that open-minded, I didn't realise that you really understood and believed in all of that, his face dropped a million miles, now you did that because you're aware, Tony, of what you need to do now, it's no good battling with him to try and prove the point. Mm. You're never going to do it. He's got a set agenda. Mm. Mm. Do you understand yeah, what I'm yes, getting yes. at? Years ago, we didn't do that because we weren't aware enough mm. to go. We just went with the flow. We thought we were doing the right thing, mm. and we weren't. We were just submissive and, and, and giving bits. Correct. I was told on the QT that Mr. French had a paranormal incident that he's never quite got over involving a cat. Uh, <laughs> I've been told this from a source. Uh, yeah, I right, actually yeah, like right. Chris French. I think he's an absolute yeah, yeah, pussy yeah. cat. He's a nice bloke. Uh, but anyway, yeah. it involved a cat. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether this is correct, but uh, I'll just say no more. But it involved a cat. It was a bit of a Schrodinger's uh, thing. I was just going to say yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. And it, 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 it keeps in the box, that. did it? Yeah, well, really? that's it. More, more, or less, more or less something like that. And I was going to come up with some, some, some earth shattering information, Nigel. I'm, I'm, I'm just fascinated with, 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 all you've, with all you've got to say. Uh, what was I going to come on to next? I've forgotten listeners save me what was i going to tell nigel next? oh yes event settle november is what we were going to wow. talk about next we, we've arranged a conference lord help us uh in um in settle cheapest chips conference i'll be there <laughs> you're there paula's paula green is that correct paula is green paula elizabeth green yeah That's she's it. great uh, tell, us, yeah. tell us about the event nigel yeah, OK, well, it's on 9-11, uh, funnily enough, and we didn't plan that. It just happened to, to come up with that date, you know, that was available for the hall that we were going to use. Um, it's in Settle, but in the area where the portal is, I've written about in a book. So what we tried to do is, you know, Tony, you're going to be doing some remote viewing at this event, aren't you? Yes. Um, which, which I'm sure you'll talk about in a second to and, and explain what that is yeah. which will go down a storm. That ties in brilliantly with all the portal stuff that we're doing anyway, yeah. um, but also uh, myself, I'm going to be talking about the UFO sightings in the area, how it ties in with the NSA and then with Hill and, and the portal itself. And then we've got Paula on who's going to sort of give her a, a very, very sort of um, candid view really, I would say, of her own ET experiences with the Greys. She's had these all her life and, and she doesn't fear them. She actually in recent sort of correspondences she's been telling me she actually misses them when they don't happen, even though they do abduct her. And I think that's that's it's humanity coming a long way there that we actually are willing to interact with some of these beings and, and she, she's going to explain why she would want to do that mm -hmm. which I think is going to be fascinating mm -hmm. you know and she's very I don't know people that, that she's in the same sort of vein as uh, Sasha Claire Christie who you know well you know that, that same up in your face mm -hmm. no owls bad mm -hmm. you know true Yorkshire grit and give him how it is no, that's thing. absolutely so, excellent isn't it that sounds yeah, really good so, and of course Nigel you're you're talking about your um, your portal book is that is that correct well not your portal book but you, you've got the you've got your fascinating book and you are you are an amazing speaker 
Uh, you can hold an audience uh, very well. Uh, you're very good at uh, speaking, and your story is fascinating. I recommend. I appreciate you saying yeah, well, that. Well, it's not Sorry. your story; it's your research that you've done, really, isn't it? Which is fascinating. You've not just gone through this half baked. You've actually done a lot of research, uh, a hell of a lot. Of Tony, research. I mean, this is one of the things. Can I just mention yeah. that? I mean, I, I, I really appreciate what you're saying. You're a great guy, and I, I have the utmost, you know, admiration for you as well, Tony. I've done for several years. Well, I still owe you before, a five, Nigel. Nigel. You can give me it when, when you come to the top. <laughs> you know, I'll let you in for free. Cheers, mate. <laughs> Thanks, buddy. No problems. But what I'm trying to say is, is that this is what I'm trying to get across. You've, you've mentioned there about how I deliver my talks. Yes. I've not always been like that, no. but I'm going to give you a little tip. Back in the 1980s, there used to a heck of a lot of talks in there on, on the Ugly Moor yeah. UFO scene, yeah? Yes. But there were very basic sort of talks on... Um, you know, this happened here, there's a bit of history there. Bit of... And I'd say they were quite boring in a way, but I did get the point across on that. But what I soon found was that halfway through my talk, I'd go off off schedule. I'd go off finding that I wasn't talking about what I planned, but new ideas were coming to my head and hitting me left, right and centre. And I, I've learned since then what were going on there, right. that I am guided right. through my guy Charlotte, mm. because at the end of the day, it isn't about delivering words with your mouth, Tony, that is really important. No, it isn't, no. You know, in the future, I'm pretty sure humanity will be using different senses to the ones, the five senses we use today. And what it's about is really getting people to recognise the worth of the words. Yes. Does that make sense ah, to it you? Does. It absolutely does. Uh, it and absolutely project does. that worth so people can feel that this is genuine, this is true, yeah? Yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah exactly. It's all about that, really. Exactly. Yeah? And exactly. I hope that is coming across. Yeah, it? yes, yeah, it, it's very true. And, uh, you know, I think that's why I get a good following, because yeah. uh, my story has not changed since year dot, and it won't change. As somebody, a mate of mine who's got a very important job, um, it was telling me, and he's he's not really into this, but he said in, in every interview he's heard, my story hasn't changed, which it hasn't. No. Uh, and no. it won't change until I go to the grave. It's not going to. You're telling the truth. No, I'm it's telling a the truth. That's what happens so. to me, you know. And, yeah, and, and, yeah. And, and, and that's and that's the thing. And we, we'll be doing the remote viewing thing. We'll be yeah. looking at uh, the Russian remote viewing techniques, which is very rare gold dust information. Um, yeah. And I'll be putting together um, a DVD ROM of, of information, which will be like gold dust. It'll, it'll have all the stuff on it, including a full blown remote viewing course um, and, and all that kind of thing. So you'll certainly be getting your money's worth, uh, Nigel. Won't you? For about twenty quid. Oh, the door. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's great one. value for money. And what, what we're doing, we're taking into account that you know we're in the middle of this recession, so-called yeah. recession, yeah. and it's difficult for people. You know, with Christmas coming up a few months later, we, we've got to really look at this. But we're happy to impart our knowledge and our information. Yeah, and what I'd love to be able to do, maybe we, if this, this is okay and a success, is maybe do more of these in the future. We, yeah, you know, course. as a little group of people, yeah. um, and, and take this, you know, from different areas. So, really. To me, Nigel, it doesn't matter if two walk through the door, or ten walk through the door, or thirty walk through the door, or one through the door it just exactly. all, we do, you just truck on with it don't you, of course uh, you do. yeah, uh, and it's, it, that, that's what's got to be but to be uh, honest um, with you i mean i must say this now because it may encourage other people to come forward i mean we have got a website which we can mention at the end if you'll mention yep. at the end of the show Tony. Um, but where you can actually purchase tickets for the show yep. or for the talk should i say um, and and up to now, you know, things are looking good. I've had quite a few people who are showing their interest, you know, and yes. they've actually been getting tickets. So I think we'll have more than one or two there. Yes, you know, we've got, a, we've got uh, an again. inquiry from the show, Nigel, as well. Uh, I'll, yeah. I'll have to get back to the gentleman, but we have had an inquiry from the uh, from the show uh, to the show uh, regarding uh, regarding attendance. So it's going to be absolutely excellent. And I mean, I mean, you know, the remote viewing courses out there they're costing anything from a four hundred to four hundred yeah. to a thousand pounds. They're uh, giving it away, mate. Aren't yeah, I am in a way, but it's 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 you know it's it it is. It is entertainment purposes, but it also gives an insight, a very good feel as to what they did during the Cold War, what the Russians did and what the Americans did in uh, in their remote viewing techniques. And also, in some cases, there's been some staggering results. John O'Brien, who's on the uh, who's on the Planet X network, uh, he did a remote viewing thing for me where we were where, when the UFOs were coming in over my home. He was remote viewing them at the same time, and yeah. he actually said, "There's one." One at my nine o'clock. It's one at your nine o'clock. Go out now. When I went out, it was at nine o'clock. There it was, and it, wow. uh, it flashed. And I, I thought, Ruddy, uh, Ruddy Nora, uh, John, that's uh, that's absolutely amazing. No, one o'clock it was. Yeah, it's one o'clock, not nine o'clock. It was at my one o'clock, and it was. There it was. Uh, and it flashed off because he'd seen it via his, uh, his really good remote remote viewing. viewing. Now the thing is, uh, Nigel, yeah. you know, it would make an interesting thing for a for a TV program to have that going on where we. Could oh play, yeah, you know. I mean, this is the thing with with, with the, the accusations. I'm not going to go into them here, Tony. So don't worry. But you know, pe- some people that know me will know that I've had a heck of a week. You know, with people trying to say that a lot of the channel I do is fake. Now yeah. I can't prove 
Oh, well, I can prove that by the information that comes through. Yeah. Um, but then you're always going to get people say, well, you already knew that. And it's very, very difficult, you know, to, to, yeah, yeah. to prove this. But um, that would, I've never, ever feared and I never will. And that's why it works, trying to explain why these things like remote viewing, channeling, psychic awareness and things work. Because if you don't fear and you know that they're going to work, Tony, they do usually do work. And yeah. you do usually get the information. Yeah. So a TV show, you know, and, and demonstrate this happening and bring through good information, not airy-fairy well, it could be this, could be that, but really good direct information. Yeah, well, this, this you is know, what that's we want. What it, it, it is. I've got some very good, uh, I've got some mind-blowing ideas that would probably make a TV executive reach for his drinks cabinet. <laughs> but I've got, I've got, a, I've got a mind-blowing idea uh, wow. for, for when, when, when we push, when we, when, when I do, when I do my documentary. Nigel, he says with his narcissistic ego. Yeah, yeah no, what go I, for what it. I, <laughs> what I want to do is get one of these, uh, get somebody like John O'B on and, and a few others too. Actually, as the UFO, if we can get them in sync, if I can get them coming over, yeah, uh, you know, and get them remote viewing at the same oh, time. Wow. It would be a fascinating experiment. Wow. Would it be broadcast? Would we get de-noticed? I, I've no idea. Well, I'm a little bit uh, worried I'd... about this meeting in Settles, John. We're only about 20-odd mile away from Enwith Hill as yeah, the crow well, well, flies. They'll, they'll yeah, turn yeah, up. They'll be coming to have a listen, won't they, probably? Of course they will. Of course they will. And, and just in closing, Nigel, uh, yeah. just before I close the show... Um, Interestingly enough, I've written an, an article, well, not written an article, I wrote an article, I'll put some up on YouTube regarding uh, the surveillance state beyond Snowden, uh, regarding mind control, the fact that I'd been tortured uh, from 1999 to 2003 with mind control, right. uh, which I make no apology for saying. No, no, um, no. Do you think, in your opinion, there is a surveillance state more advanced than uh, electronic eavesdropping and emails? Definitely. We need to yeah. look at, I'll tell you where we need to look at, and you know a lot about this, Tony, because of your other interests, microwave. Microwave yeah. technology wasn't brought about just to cook your own, your bangers in the, in the oven sort of thing. It's, it's to do with actually altering brain waves. And, and there are ultraviolet you know, waves now that we know about, different types of microwaves yes. where they are controlling people. People just do yeah. not realise it. And I've had the same experience in the past. I mean, did you have the terrible headaches, Tony? Did you have the, the almost like feeling that something was in your mind, but you didn't was... know what it was? What what happened to me was I've got it written in my diary. I'd, I'd been followed, I'd been stalked, and uh, I had the phone calls as well. But what also happened to me in January 2001 was I was attached, uh, attacked in the in the epicenter of my consciousness, Hitchcock style, like a stabbing sensation. Yeah. Uh, and what they were doing, what these individuals were doing, uh, the fucking bozos, is they were um, <laughs> they were uh, what they were doing now was they were testing a weapons platform. They're very clever. They know they're full, they're fully aware it can't be proven. They're very clever oh, people. Yeah. Yeah, they're yeah, smart yeah. Um, and so th they were testing a weapons platform on me if you the, the bizarre surveillance that went on that was overt it's an absolute scandal uh, they'll, we'll never be able to prove it and the messenger will get shot but Tony, the thing with it is yeah. I, to, I, I fully understand what you're saying there but I could help you to prove that exactly the same thing happened to me in about 1992 right let me 92. explain to you let me explain right. to you what happened to me and I've got medical proof of this right I started getting sinus pains shortly after my UFO encounter in 1980, which went on for about 10 years. Eventually, oh. I couldn't cope with it anymore. I was getting, you know, weepy eyes and, and problems with the nasal cavity. So I went oh. to the doctors and I had the x-rayed and, the, you know, the, the ear, nose and eye clinic basically oh. said to me back then, under the doctor, that I'd had a, a traumatic injury to the front of my skull in that Jesus area. Nice. Right, listen, yeah? And I knew, they said, within the last six months, you've ever been in a car accident? Do you play rugby? Somebody's hit you full in the face? Uh, have you, you know, anything like that? Has anything happened? And nothing at all had happened. God, I would have known about it, you know? I'd have right. had a bruise in all over my face and everything. There was nothing that I knew right. about that could be that. And what they showed me on the X-ray was that all around... I mean, it was a little bit tender to touch, but I always put it down to the side, you know, sinus problems. But what they showed me was all around the front of... around my eye sockets and around the nasal cavity... The bone there, and it still is to this day, was shattered into millions of small pieces. And they told me at that time that there was a, a loss of how, without me having any recognition of how that could happen, without a blow to the face or an accident, the only possible way which was new technology God, could be coming in was microwave energy. God, God. And I have that to this day. As well, you're, near, you're near Harrogate as well, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. Well, you want to think about when I had my UFO encounter, where mm. did it head for, men with mm. health? Mm. Mm. It all mm. ties together, yeah? Mm. So, so really, you need to keep on with that, Tony, because, you know, have a think about what things have happened in your life. 
that's outside of the subject, really. It's all listed in journals, Nigel, from yeah. 1999 to about uh, 2003. Right. Uh, and, then, and then I stopped keeping a journal because I can't keep up with it. Uh, I'm writing my, my, my new book, Plug Plug, called... Uh, yeah, I, I'm uh, looking forward to that. Plug Plug, called uh, Alien, uh, Alien Darknet, uh, which, yeah. is, uh, which will kind of like take us to the next level uh, of, what, of what has been going on. But these people need to be uh, brought to account. And, uh, you know, they're acting... There's an element of the national security apparatus in all this that's running bloody riot, and elements of the government know this. Yeah, well, in that uh, case, Tony, yeah. I, I pretty well knew. Again, it's instinctive knowing I was working with this guy. I knew that the, 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 the underground, I'll call it, at Men With Hill, were targeting me because... Yeah. I'd had this encounter, and mm. probably no, you know, there's a future, there's a, a timeline thing that comes into this, where I think they can look to the future and see where you're likely. Not that you're definitely, but because of dimensions, there are other possibilities, and where you're likely to go with this. And they try and do things to try and stop you, you know, yeah, a lot of yeah, ways. Yeah. You, you, you're onto something there, Nigel, that is a bit of a very advanced elephant in the room that needs oh, to yeah. be written coherently uh, for people to understand, because it is I a know. bit of a shocker. Uh, it, it, it certainly is. And I think the, the thing is, is that when I was followed, by them um, overtly uh, in a lot of cases they had car keys in the hand uh, they always had car keys in the hand right, right. they were so casual about it they were so kind of blasé yeah. uh, about what they were doing that they, and you wouldn't have thought, thought so would you but they were um, no 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 that's the best cover isn't it uh, the best cover isn't it and, yeah, exactly, you know, yeah. and, and they're there and uh, I don't know where it's uh, I, I don't know where it's going now currently at the moment but I, I do know that they've backed off I made them back off uh, you know it was a private war and I made them uh, I made them back off I'm probably uh, probably one of the only men that has probably made these people People back off. Well, you've been brave uh, enough, Tony. That's yeah, the thing. Yeah. Yeah, you've been brave it. enough to expose them, but and that's correct. where they have to back off. Because yeah. there are lots of people out there that these things are happening to, and they've become yeah. so inward with it, yeah. and they hold it all to themselves that so they crack up and end up in the local loony yeah, home. And that's, is, that, that's what they're banking on, really. Yeah, this is, uh, that is what they're banking on. And I've suffered a great deal from it, Nigel. Yeah, though I have yeah, to say, the, 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 the toil of it, as you well know, is is unbelievable. But I, I think you know. But but if you come to the um, if you come to the uh, the seminar that we're uh, that we're having in November at Settle, what's the address? of it, Nigel. Uh, right, it's at the St. John's Hall, which yeah. is opposite the St. John's Church, Methodist Church. Yeah. It's a lovely hall. Um, it's a massive hall, so we'll get plenty of people in there. We're going to have tables around the side so that you can come and, you know, if people want to hire a table, the £10 each, if you want to sell your books or your goods on these tables, right. you know, you're welcome to do so. But for the people that are coming to actually listen to the uh, the speakers, including ourselves, you know, the, the, there's plenty of seats in there. Um, at the moment, I would I would I would buy a ticket to make sure that you know online, to make sure that you do get a seat because I can imagine as it gets nearer the date, it will be getting quite full up. But you know, the the, the facilities are great there. You know, it's got a kitchen there. Where Helen will be serving teas, coffee. Oh, lovely! That's yeah, great. and then what we're going to do after that, Tony, which which I'm hoping everybody will join in that comes along to it. There are places to stay quite reasonably in the area, so. Right. If you, if you are able to stay over from the Saturday into Sunday, in the evening we're going to get a group of us together and go up to the actual portal area. Right. I'll talk about my book, and we're going to do a sky watch up there. So, right, uh, lovely. It sounds that, yeah, it's really good value for money. This, you know, that, that sounds absolutely excellent. Yeah. And, of course, and I think if I'm going to be there, uh, I think we'll have something turn up. Oh yeah, because yeah. they follow me like the bloody plague. So you well, better bring a weird tone, eh? Yeah, well, this is it, matey. Although it. you know, a TV crew turned up a few weeks back and nothing bloody happened, and then and that's what. Days, hey, that's how it goes. Yeah, and then three days later to start turning up, it's bloody bloody surreal. Yeah, but right. but that's it. But anyway, Nigel, that's yeah, it. I'm off, I'm off to the lamb and flag for last. Can I come with you for a quick one? You can, mate. No problems. There's a pint on the bar for me. I've got. Now, the okay, beckons. Okay. This is the Tony Topping Show on Planet X. Planet X. The truth is on air. This is Planet X. Planet X. Broadcasting to you from the studios of Planet X, this is the Tony Topping Show. Planet X. Planet X. Get in 
touch with Planet X. Call, text, email, find us on Facebook. I was going to the Lamb and Flag, but I'm not. It's the Tony Topping Show. A very special guest on the program, which is George, gorgeous George Galloway, who's come on to chat about Syria. I'm interested to ask him a few questions, and I'm very interested on his comments regarding some of the projects he's working on. Without further ado, Mr. George Galloway, good evening. Good evening to you. A pleasure to be on with you, Tony. Thank you very much, matey. From the days of talk sport, you were interviewing me about UFOs, and now I'm interviewing you. And, yes. And, it's funny. And the it's question, a funny old world, as Mrs. Thatcher said. It is, it is a funny old world, isn't it? And, and the question I want to ask you, George, is uh, somebody uh, like me who's a I member mean, of the public who, who you know, who's you know, uh, looking at all this, is asking the question, why is why? there a money for a money? war? With Syria, Syria, but there isn't but the money for money. there isn't the money for basic welfare provisions, jobs, jobs schools, etc. That's right. Well, we've never got money for the public services we need, but we've always got money to go around the world setting fire to other people's countries. We don't have money to keep our old pensioners warm in the winter time, but we can set fire to Iraq and Afghanistan play a role in the setting fire to Palestine and Lebanon. And now uh, we see the British government trying to persuade other governments in the world to do what the British Parliament would not allow them to do, which was join a new war against Syria. And uh, it beggars belief, actually, that a country which is almost bankrupt can have unlimited funds for death and destruction and at this very moment, this evening, in London, there are protesters blocking the roads in East London to try to stop people going to a weapons fair, an arms bazaar, where Britain is inviting all the grisly dictators from around the world to come and buy weapons off us. And on the front page of the Mail on Sunday today, we saw the most remarkable splash headline that the chemical weapons we say that the government of Syria used a few weeks ago on the outskirts of Damascus were sold to them by British companies with the connivance and with the license given by the very British government that now wants us to go to war. You really couldn't make it up, Tony. You, you, you couldn't make it, you know, as a member of the public, seeing David Cameron stand up there and talk about the, the, you know, talk about the disturbance he had regarding the killing of innocent children, men and women. Uh, surely Mr. Cameron, George, is a great humanitarian. He, he has this strong moral compass to do the right thing within the international community. Am I, tech, am I being duped there? Well, he invited us in his speech in Parliament to take a look at the videos Right. of the suffering and death of 338 Indeed. people, he said, uh, in Iraq. The French say it was 238. The Americans say it was 1,488. Hmm. So their intelligence uh, doesn't seem to be able to tally. Uh, but, of course, there are many videos from Syria out there hmm. in the public hmm. arena hmm. on YouTube. One of which I posted on my Facebook page, George Galloway MP, this very evening. I warn you, you'd have to have a strong stomach to watch it. But it was yet another of literally thousands of videos put up by Al-Qaeda elements in the civil war in Syria, supported by us, armed by us, financed by us, sawing off a man's head and holding it up to the camera whilst chanting the name of God and other um, uh, religious incantations. It, uh, it beggars belief that this country is being asked to join a war on the side of Al-Qaeda. Yes, the same Al-Qaeda, which uh, 12 years ago, almost to the day, flew airplanes into the Twin Towers, murdered thousands of Americans. We all saw the buildings tumbling down. We saw the people jumping out of the windows. We saw the horror of it all. But now, 12 years later, there are allies. Well, no, thank you. I don't want to be allies of Al-Qaeda, and I don't think the majority of British people do either. 
Yeah, <laughs> indeed, George. And you, you talk about the, the... There is. Do you think there is a confusion in mainstream society regarding people who worship peaceful Islam, the peaceful Islamic faith, compared to the people who are in Al-Qaeda? Do you see this ignorance in our society quite often? Well, uh, of course, the, the person who allegedly... I say allegedly, though we saw him do it, uh, try to cut off the head of a British young drummer boy uh, in the streets of Woolwich in South London uh, just a few months ago. Uh, if he had done that in Syria, William Hague would have given him money and would have given him the weapons with which to do it. We are encouraging in Syria the very elements we are terrorized by here at home who blew themselves up, for example, on 7-7-2005, on the London Underground and on a London bus. We are encouraging the demons, the serpents of extremism on the immoral principle that my enemy's enemy is my friend. Well, your enemy's enemy isn't always your friend. Sometimes your enemy's enemy is worse than your enemy. And we didn't learn the lesson of Afghanistan in the 1980s when we brought forth the monster of bin Ladenism, of the Taliban, and the kind of people that we're now fighting uh, in Afghanistan. And some of our young men, hundreds of them, in fact, have come home dead in boxes. And uh, thousands of our young men have been wounded and maimed, fighting the very people that we armed, financed, and conjured forth in the first place. So, so really so, what we're saying is William Hague, the Foreign Secretary, is fully aware of what he's doing, is fully aware of the rank hypocrisy uh, the, of uh, this action. Uh, but, but, uh, and and how, do you, how do you view that as, a, as an MP within Westminster when you meet these individuals as to your gender at play? How, how do you, why are you doing this? I asked the Prime Minister, you can look it up right. uh, on uh, YouTube, I asked the Prime Minister, Prime Minister's question time, about five months ago, if he would adumbrate for the House the main differences, just the main ones, between the Al-Qaeda we were fighting in Mali and the Al-Qaeda we were supporting in Syria. Answer, he had none. I asked him, these hand-chopping, throat-cutting, head-chopping people that are our allies in Syria are exactly the same people that we are fighting in Mali, as we and the French uh, set out to do, that we are fighting in Afghanistan, the very same kind of people, extremists of the most bloodthirsty, bestial variety, are our allies in Syria and our enemies elsewhere. No one could make sense of such a policy. It is close to a definition of insanity. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, I totally yeah. agree with you. And George, uh, what, what intrigues me the most about you is, is you know, I've been an admirer of your work, very strong, very strong in what you believe in. Uh, can you indulge my imagination for a minute? You are, let us imagine, uh, it's number 10 Downing Street. You are the Prime Minister, your Prime Minister, George Galloway, the press are outside, you've got the serious situation to deal with, you've got the Assad regime to deal with. If you're the Prime Minister... What would you do, Prime Minister Galloway, with this situation? How would you handle it? It's, it's quite simple. We have to stop doing what we're doing right now. Just this week, David Cameron, in this country of ours, which has millions of people unemployed, which has laid off uh, hundreds of thousands of public servants, which is uh, presiding over a more divided society than we have ever had, gave yet another... £57 million pounds to the Syrian rebels. This brings to hundreds of million, hundreds of millions of pounds of British taxpayers' money that has been given to the Syrian rebels in the last two years. So we're going to stop doing what the previous government of David Cameron has been doing. We're going to do instead the following. We're going to support a negotiated settlement, a political solution to the crisis in Syria, the framework of which already exists and was drawn up by the respected former head of the United Nations, Kofi Annan, more than a year and a half ago after he was uh, uh, summarily sacked uh, by Britain and America for having done so. He brought forward a framework called Geneva One. 
Geneva I was a framework of a negotiated settlement, a political route to a negotiated settlement to a transition to democracy in Syria. This was sabotaged by Britain and America, which thought that it could bring down the Assad regime on the battlefield. That has failed, and a 100,000 people are now dead as a result. We are going to refloat Geneva II under the joint chairmanship of the United States and Russia, and we're going to force the belligerents to sit there until they've reached a solution. And neither side is going to receive another bomb, another bullet, another gun, or another dollar in aid of any kind until they have settled their accounts in Geneva and agreed a way forward for a transition to democracy in Syria. And how would you, George, uh, visualise this? This gives the listeners a very good landscape, this concept I'm coming at you with, I feel. How would you then, George, I'm intrigued to know, if the red phone's ringing, the President's on the other end saying, Prime Minister Galloway, our Navy is in the Syrian waters, this, that and the other, what, what would you advise the President? What would you say to him in that scenario? I'd say that such an action would be absolutely illegal, that Britain, their closest ally, so close there was almost a Lewinsky-like closeness over the last uh, decade or more, uh, will come to an end if you commit this crime. And we will seek to prosecute you in the international criminal courts, uh, which you have not signed up to, but which nonetheless will be invited by us to take a judgment on the illegal act that you are proposing to take. It does not have the support of the United Nations. The United Nations is the arbiter of international law, not any one government or two or three governments within the international community. And we're going to support a peace process, a negotiated settlement to this crisis. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, exactly. 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 Absolutely. 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 You, you've given your thoughts very clearly there, George, and it makes a lot of sense. You, you think then the consequences of um, hitting Sy uh, Syria's infrastructure with cruise missiles, etc., etc., what do you think, how will the game play alter in that country if America and, let us say, Britain uh, go ahead with that? And the second question, do you think that Cameron, Mr. Cameron, our Prime Minister, is capable of betraying the democratic process and finding some way, some very little dodgy loophole so he can get involved in the conflict. Uh, on the latter point, I doubt that. Right. Although the mass media are doing everything that they can right. to push us into that position. Yes. The BBC and Sky are daily and all day mm. uh, dilating on whether or not the vote of the House of Commons can be reversed. Mm -hmm. But it will not be reversed. If Cameron were to bring it back, he would suffer an even more humiliating defeat. Mm because the British Parliament, so close to an election, can hear the views of the great majority, 89% in fact, in the last poll in the Daily Telegraph, which I saw, are against it. And the British politicians will not go quietly into that good night. The shadow of Iraq and what happened to Tony Blair is too long and too uh, great for that to happen. Uh, but on the first point, I must tell you that any American attack on Syria will quickly become a regional war. The first consequence will be that Syria and its allies will launch a military assault against Israel. Israel will undoubtedly retaliate. And then we will have a regional war between the Arabs and the Israelis and possibly the Iranians and the Israelis, all, all setting fire to the most combustible place on the earth, where so much of the world's energy resources are deposited. The streets, streets of uh, Hormuz will be on fire. No oil will move out of the Gulf. Go oil and gas fields in the dictatorships in the Persian Gulf uh, are best friends. Saudi Arabia, Qatar, uh, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, and so on, will all be on fire. There will be a cataclysm which will reverberate around the world, and it will not be confined to that region either, because terrorism will spread across the world like wildfire. So be afraid, be very afraid of what the consequences will be if Barack Obama launches this war in the next few days or weeks. 
What, why well, do you think, Kurt, George, you, you, you strike me as a man of peace. Why do you think there is such an agenda uh, going on? Are you guided by religious faith? And do you think there is a, a battle between good and evil? Or, uh, what, what drives you, George, religiously to... Do you think there is a battle between good and evil and it's a re religious proportions? No, I, no. I, I don't no. think in such manichaean right. terms. Right. In fact, it troubles me greatly that there are tens of millions of people, particularly in the United States, mm. religious mm. fanatics who want to bring about Armageddon, mm. who want mm. this to be the end of times, who believe that Jesus will come back if only we can fight Armageddon. Uh, Armageddon is a town in uh, what is now called Israel, by the way. And they hope that on these holy lands, some kind of cataclysm leading to a rapture and the return of the Messiah can occur. I just think that this kind of thinking is doomed to lead humanity to destruction. I don't believe in good versus evil. There are evil people on all sides. I'm not a supporter of the regime in Syria. I've already told you that I want to see a transition to democracy in Syria, negotiated at Geneva under joint superpower uh, uh, chairmanship. So this is not good versus evil. But I promise you that evil will prevail in that region and around the world if we are plunged into this disaster by a United States President, Barack Obama, who was elected to bring these wars to an end, not to begin new ones. Do you think he's manipulated? Do you think the British Prime Minister and the US President are manipulated by uh, what we would say military industrial complex uh, issues or, or lobbying? Uh, a Raytheon, for example, their shares are going through the roof, George. They're well, doing very well. I wish, I wish I could say that I believe that. Right. But I'm afraid the truth is more prosaic. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This is down to the politicians. Nobody can manipulate President Barack Obama. He doesn't have to face re-election ever again in his life. He's in his second term. He defeated John McCain by a landslide victory, only to hand over to John McCain the conduct of U.S. foreign policy in the Middle East. It beggars belief, but no one is manipulating him. He's entirely responsible for his own actions. No, this is about protecting Israel, yes, it's about controlling the Middle East and its energy resources, yes. But above all, it's about projecting American power to show any upstart, upcoming members of the BRICS, uh, Russia uh, mm. and China mm. in particular, mm. that America remains top dog mm. and that no competition for that position will be tolerated. And I think that uh, we in Britain and the rest of the world should not pay the price of American hegemony in the world. Yes. We need to bring about an end to single superpower rule in the world. We need multipolarity in the world with lots of powerful countries and blocks in the world. We were safer when we had that. We've been unsafe ever since we ceased to have it 20 or more years ago. Mm. Mm -hmm. You you refer, George, a fascinating remark. You refer to Syria as the last castle of Arab dignity. Could you tell the listeners more about that remark that I read? You were quoted as saying. It's the real reason that the Western countries hate the Assad regime in Syria. It's not because it's a dictatorship. We love dictatorship in the Middle East. All of our best friends are dictatorships. As a matter of fact, almost every country in the Middle East is a dictatorship. It's not because it's one family rule. We love one family rule. Al Saud has even called its country after the name of its one family rule. In the government of Kuwait, all 27 members of the government have the same family name, Al Sabah. It's a family business, like all of these friends of ours in the Arab world. So it's not for any of these reasons. It's because the Assad regime maintains a position of belligerence and war against Israel. It refuses to accept that Israel, which has occupied a part of Syria since 1967, imagine, a decade after decade, part of Syria has been illegally occupied by Israel. And Syria and its regime has never accepted it, 
has never signed a surrender peace deal with Israel in the way that other Arab countries have done. It's because Assad will not sever his relations with either the Palestinian resistance or the Lebanese resistance, Hezbollah, which gave Israel its only ever defeat on the battlefield in an Arab-Israeli conflagration. And because, perhaps this is the most important one of all, because Assad will not sever his relations with the Islamic Republic of Iran. And to a very large extent, this is a proxy confrontation. They are not yet ready to confront Iran, so they are confronting the next best thing, which is an Arab country sympathetic to Iran. Do you, uh, do you think, George, that the, the end game is Iran then? Do you think they will attack Iran or do you now think that Russia and China have, are now putting the, the, uh, the two-fingered salute up to America? Do you think the conflict could escalate with involvement Russia and China in an engagement between America, Russia and China militarily? Do you think that's what it could escalate to? If it, uh, if it became a war against Iran, definitely. Yeah. I think we would then be in World War Three. And uh, right. if that's not enough to keep you awake tonight, I, I don't know what would. Yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. Tell the listeners, George, this interesting story that I noted about you, where you uh, there's a witless article in the Daily Telegraph uh, about you taking money from an Assad-sponsored uh, TV station. The Daily Telegraph failed to mention, however, that the establishment that uh, you are challenging on this issue offered Assad a knighthood. How do you answer your critics to that article? That uh, what I've read is that you took money from a Syrian-sponsored TV station. Well, you can say I took money from a TV station in return for presenting TV programs for them. And they only know that in the Daily Telegraph because I've registered it, as I'm required to do, in the House of Commons Register of Members' Interests. I'm a TV presenter and a radio presenter, and I get money for presenting programs. The TV station in question is the fastest growing television station in the Arab world. Al Mayadeen Television has, in one year, built an audience of tens, scores of millions of people across the Arab world because it's telling the truth mm-hmm. about Syria and about other Arab-Arab and Arab-else uh, conflicts and issues. It's an outstanding television station. I'm proud to work for it. And, of course, I get paid for my work. I I was paid to work for Talk Sport. I'm paid to work for Al Maidin Television, and if the BBC want to offer me uh, a TV program, I'll be pleased to be paid by them for doing so too. So you're not bothered so, then, George, about working for the BBC? That would be a state broadcaster. Then you wouldn't wouldn't bother you no, about it. No, I wouldn't for this for this reason, and it's the same reason uh, that pertains in Al Maidin Television. Nobody tells me what to say. Nobody right. tells me what to think. I say and think what I say and think, whoever I'm working for. And nobody at al Maidin has ever asked me to say anything or asked me not to say anything. And if the BBC would make me the same offer, I'd be glad to do a programme for them. Gotcha, gotcha. Interestingly, George, as a member of the public, I just want your thoughts on this. Why do I need to turn to Russia Today or Press TV uh, to see uh, what's going on. It, your people. thoughts on that. As a member of the British public, I have to watch Russia Today and Press and TV, Press which has now been removed by Ofcom, I, to find out what is really going on in the world. Your thoughts your on that thoughts. issue? Well, you'll be glad to know I'm shortly, with my wife, uh, going to be starting a weekly programme on Russia Today. Lovely. Which Lovely. is, uh, I think, the only credible international news station mm-hmm. available mm-hmm. on satellites around the world that we have left. And watching RT and then watching Sky and BBC is a parallel universe. It is. Looking at exactly the same story, exactly the same issues, but from an entirely different standpoint. And I agree with Russia Today's standpoint. I think they're telling the truth and the BBC and Sky are lying. Very, very, well, very, true, very true, very true indeed. I, I just find your clarifications of these points fascinating, George. Tell me something for the listeners. I, I describe you as a bit of a grey man because the media um, portray you as being an Assad supporter, which I, I, I think that's not great. I think that you're a man who, who, who perceives the situ- situation well. And in that case, we're looking at the 
It said there it was said an it, article that you flattered Assad's that, aides in getting, getting aid, aid over to the, the Palestinian Palis uh, camps uh, there. I'm fascinated I'm fa by this story. I'm Can you tell the listeners what that was what all that was about and, 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 and how you managed to do this? To, I'm fascinated. I'm fascinated. Well, I flattered the governments of every country that we drove a very large convoy of aid to the Palestinian people in Gaza uh, who were under siege and bombardment by Israel. And to move a convoy uh, of many vehicles and many people and a great deal of aid requires you to flatter every government, including our own. I had to flatter the chief constables of the Metropolitan Police in Kent and all the way down to the Channel ports I had to flatter the French authorities, had to flatter the Italian authorities, had to flatter the Greek authorities, the Turkish authorities, the Syrian authorities, the dictatorship of Hosni Mubarak in Egypt. I'm ready to flatter any authority to get aid to people who are dying for the want of it in a besieged territory mm -hmm. which has been besieged and occupied for 65 or more years by the criminal state of Israel. It's OK it's then, George, for, for Israel to drop phosphorus bombs on uh, Palestinian for civilians, but obviously but there's another rule for the international community when it comes to what's going on in Syria. Would I get that correct? Right. Yes, and we learn from the Mail on Sunday today, front page splash, that the chemical weapons which uh, we are told Assad has and are told has used, although I don't myself believe that, but has, I have no doubt, were sold to him by British companies. British companies mm -hmm. sold Assad the sarin nerve gas that we're now being asked to bomb Syria for the possession of. Is, is now a cabinet aware of that, do you think? Would be the Prime Minister? Would he be fully aware of this? The government admitted it on the front page of the Mail on Sunday this very day. I don't understand I don't. how a Prime Minister can stand up in front of his own people, George, and say this is wrong to, to gas innocent men, women and children, while at the same time the very administration that he serves is, is, is flogging uh, chemical components to, with weapon, for weapons to Syria. Well, we've been, here, we've been here before, Tony. Yeah. yeah. The, the Iraq inquiry, arms to Iraq inquiry, yeah. so yeah. expertly dissected in 40 minutes by the late Robin Cook, proved... Uh, beyond any shadow of a doubt that the Thatcher government was supplying weapons, including weapons which were turned into chemical assault on the Kurdish people, for example, by Saddam Hussein. They did fuck they all did with that, George, that. didn't they? The Bush, they did nothing with the Kurdish people was gassed. The hypocrisy is staggering. In fact, the British and American government, for many months after that crime, when I was demonstrating outside the Iraqi embassy mm -hmm. about it, were still maintaining that it was Iran that had carried out this attack mm -hmm. rather than Iraq because we were on the side of Saddam Hussein then because he was against Iran. Now we, we've destroyed the Saddam government with the cost of a million dead Iraqis, three million exiled Iraqis, Iraq broken into a hundred pieces, each one of them governed by a sectarian militia, thousands dying every month, still 11 years, 10 years uh, after the war, getting on for 11 years, uh, that's been a great success, hasn't it? We are guilty as a country and with our main ally, the United States, of sowing murder and mayhem around the world, all the while lecturing the world about morality and justice and law. You really could not make this up. It's insane, George, as you have rightly said. It's absolutely insane. And the listeners would probably be interested, if you don't mind telling us, about the latest project that you're involved in to do with the Tony Blair documentary. Would you mind telling the listeners about that? Plug it away, kid. <laughs> I'd love to, and I'm grateful for the uh, opportunity. I'm making a documentary film called The Killing of Tony Blair. It does not, of course, involve the killing of Tony Blair, but deals with the killing done by Tony Blair and the killing being made by Tony Blair. The killing of the Labour Party as we knew it in the days of new Labour that Blair led. The killing of the million Iraqis I talked about, an uncountable number of Afghans. The killing of Syrians and uh, Lebanese and Palestinians all the while that he was Prime Minister and now, unbelievably, the so-called peace envoy in the Middle East, a peace envoy going around the area, stirring up as many wars as he possibly can, supporting brute dictatorships, 
when they put down their people uh, who ask only for democracy, Mr. Blair has made a killing out of both. He is currently earning almost £25 million pounds per year. There is no corporation, no dictatorship that he will not take money from. And I'm talking serious money, £25 million pounds a year. Mm. And it continues to this very day. Mm. On this day, he signed two new contracts with the governments of Vietnam and Peru. He's already a sovereign wealth advisor to various dictatorships around the world. And he is involved in business in the very places that he's supposed to be the Middle East peace envoy in. So the taxpayer is paying him to be the Middle East peace envoy and paying for his entourage and his protection at his many houses around this country and elsewhere, whilst he piles up the money and piles up the clutch of houses uh, that he has. And I think we've got to stop this man. I think we've got to put this man on trial and, if possible, in jail. And this documentary aims to do that. So if you want to follow it, you can go to The Blair Doc on Facebook. Uh, you can follow it on Twitter, at The Blair Doc. Or you can go to kickstarter.com, look for the killing of Tony Blair, and give anything, one pound, five pounds. Five pounds gets your name forever in the credits at the end of the movie. And larger donations get you various other uh, perks in relation to the making of this film. Think Fahrenheit 9-11, the marvelous Michael Moore uh, movie which did for George W. Bush's reputation. What Michael Moore did to George W. Bush, I aim to do to Tony Blair. Right, I don't, I don't care, George. That's, uh, and that can be on Kickstarter, listeners. If you check that out, it is on Kickstarter. It's uh, absolutely uh, fascinating. Uh, George Galloway, uh, MP, thank you very much indeed. Could you just, uh, I could I could talk for hours to you, George, but could you tell the listeners, if they're interested, a bit more about your Respect Party, please? Well, the Respect Party came out of the anti-war movement in 2003-04, when we, in our millions, marched against the war and were ignored by the mainstream political parties. I had been a, a Labour member for 36 years. I had been a Labour MP uh, for uh, 17 or 18 years. I was kicked out by Tony Blair from the Labour Party because of my role as one of the leaders of the anti-war movement. We set up respect. I have defeated New Labour in two uh, election campaigns, most recently in Bradford, where I gained 58% of the vote, therefore more than all the other parties put together. I absolutely destroyed a rock-solid Labour majority, and we are looking for members and councillors and parliamentary candidates all over this country. So if you're interested in that, go to our website, respectparty.org, that's www respectparty.org if you can play a part in changing politics in Britain for the better, we want to hear from you Thank you very thank much you. Uh, George yeah. for all your time, uh, George Galloway uh, sure. yeah. Thank you, this thank has been you. the Tony Topping Show on yeah. Planet X From aliens to angels conspiracies to cover-ups this is Planet X Taking you beyond the frontiers of high strangeness at St Anne's on Sea, at the Community Centre, St Albans Road, on the 21st of September 2013, a psychic remote viewing workshop. By popular request, a one-day course on psychic remote viewing based on the techniques of the spy agencies of the Cold War is presented for you. Participants conduct an actual target session and deeply explore the techniques pioneered by the major players in remote viewing. The day includes looking at that rare information pioneered by Russian remote viewers in understanding the cosmos. Tony Topping has nearly 30 years of knowledge in dealing with UFOs and psychic espionage. He has appeared for major broadcasters from ITV to Channel 5 News. And adding further fascination to events, our special guest will be taking attendees into the fascinating world of the human aura and first steps into stereo viewing, which peers into the spiritual realm of the self using photographic technology. All attendees will receive a CD-ROM of information packed with documents on remote viewing and aura research. It's unbeatable value at a cost of £30 
including refreshments. Concessions follow incomes are available. Just email Tony OpsUFO at hotmail.com. Tickets are available from Psychic RV Events dot eventbrite dot co dot uk that is psychic rv event dot event bright the word bright spelt b r i t e dot co dot uk come and join us for a fantastic day This is Breaking the Matrix. I am Tony Topping. This is Planet X. Planet X. After Planet X Live on Sundays, 10pm, my new show, Breaking the Matrix, covering all subjects that the mainstream media are not bothering to look at. On this edition's episode, the fascinating dialogue of the Syrian soldier and the Syrian freedom fighters trying to make peace with each other in the middle of a firefight in a street. It's a show that's not to be missed. It's Breaking the Matrix, 10 p.m. Sunday after... Good, firm evidence is that Sir Isaac Newton, in his Cambridge years, when he was doing all this, you know, top-class new science into uh, gravity and and how light refracts and things like that, all these new brilliant ideas that he brought forward was actually staying in Langcliffe. And there's there's even an arbour there today that's been kept. That's a sort of an enclosure in the garden where there's trees around the seat where Isaac Newton was supposed to have sat and pondered about all these ideas. Now, what I found really strange was that we're only hundreds of yards away from this portal. Can you imagine it back there in the 1600s? Isaac Newton sat there under this apple tree type thing, which he does the legend of the apple tree does come up in in his hometown, of course. But there is the one there in the arbour. He sat there looking at this portal area and all of a sudden, all of these ideas about how the universe works how gravity comes into being and that comes to him basically I mean you can look at the research and see that the ideas weren't there in his head before he came to the portal area now my question I ask is Tony is it just that he learned this stuff or is it that just as we get new information centres on this channeling level, was it imparted into him while he was in the portal area And what is, I mean that sounds amazingly outlandish to say that but it's pretty. I'm pretty sure that this event did happen. In that, uh, when you look at the, the way that Isaac Newton, um, he had a private life, as most people researchers know today, into alchemy and into the esoteric sciences, as you mentioned earlier. And one of the main things he was really interested in was King Solomon's Temple. Now, the way that he looked at this was from. May, very may mo- I just come in there now? Yeah, yeah. No, uh, rabbit, see if it. I can just no, not at all. Uh, no, I like no, no, no. You're not rubbing on. You're fascinated. Um, See, let, let me see if I can understand you. Could you just explain to the listeners what the esoteric significance is of King Solomon Temple? Yeah. Well, as far as the portals go, um, I'm a firm believer, and again, this is what, what you need to look at the biblical references, you need to look at the historical evidence of um, the, the Temple of Jerusalem and how it was built. There is one line that has always stuck in my mind, and that was that this place, whatever it was, where the Temple of Jerusalem, King Solomon's original temple was built, was built by no human hands. Wow. Now, this is now this is interesting that they should bring that up. And I don't think literally that we've got a this subject, you know, whereas most normal people out there you know, look on it as being a bit crazy and, and way out. But yes. it's always been part of my life, you know, that's been the thing. And I do think that it does connect heavily with the military, you know, yes. I do. Yeah, yeah, yeah it, it definitely so. And I think you you had a you had an incident with the uh, with the helicopter, uh, didn't you? Overlooking these uh, research areas, the the old green and marked helicopter, which yeah. I think is based up in uh, up at that certain place at Harrogate. I'm absolutely convinced they're coming out of there. Um, you know, definitely. and so you, you you know you you've been watched and, and all that kind of thing. So what you did is you wrote a book regarding the port regarding a portal. Can you describe to some of the listeners your version of a portal and what it means to you and how this all came about? Yeah, I mean, the portal idea has been around for years, Tony, in that, um, you know, ghost hunting and people that that look into the spirit world will say that places that are in houses and windows into other dimensions, other worlds are portals. Now, 
if you think about this scientifically, <laughs> we're actually working on, on the presumption now that um, we live in a multidimensional reality, really. And if so, then there's going to be places where we can actually come in and out of these different realities of different dimensions. And I think that um, science, uh, what we call science, has known about this for hundreds of years, at least 400 years since the 1600s. Really? That, yeah, definitely. Well, just with, as um, a matter of interest, Nigel, uh, what, what research uh, round about that date have you been looking at then to, to confirm that all sounds very interesting what kind of stuff have you looked at to to confirm they've been knowing about this from 1600 because uh, you wonder what you do is you actually underplay your esoteric knowledge which is quite vast especially in the area of words and what things truly mean so do anyway do carry on so no, no yeah you did right there um, as you know the title of the book is sir isaac newton and the secret sundial yes. and people have asked me well why would you connect isaac newton with yeah. you know this portal ufos and this sort of thing well yeah. the very fact remains is that and this was an amazing thing which you'll know that came up in the book was during during my research yes. and uh, I'm always open to influences, Tony. You know, yes. although I do do the historic research in the area to back up my claims, I am always open to channeling information through that may come from elsewhere. And I do believe that I am helped in that way. And one of these instances was that I was led uh, by following energy lines in the settled area where this portal is to a place called Landcliffe. And lo and behold, to cut a long story short, I mean, people can read about this in the book, and it's all backed up again by the beans there building this. You know, that that's just too, too silly to comprehend. But I do believe that there is something in that sentence that is saying to us, look, you need to look further into this. There's a connection between humanity and something else at this particular site. And where the, the building of the temple is, remember, what was housed in that, that Temple of Solomon? The Ark of the Covenant. What is the Ark of the Covenant? Well, in a modern scientific way, you'd say some sort of communication device, certainly between another reality, another dimension, and our own. And I do believe that this is what, what we're looking at there, is that there's been a hidden secret for many generations, passed through the Templars, that, who, who, obviously, you know, worked in that area of the Temple of Solomon, uh, right through to the Freemasons of modern day today that know this secret, that... We're not alone. You know, we are dealing with other entities that can be used for bad or good, for power or neglect, and and that's what's going on. I'm afraid we're getting we're getting uh, the powers and the authorities within the world that know about portals and know that um, you know. Maybe it's not so much the, the, with the human race in decline that we need to leave this planet in rocket ships. Maybe we just need to take a step sideways and be in another reality, oh, and that could be. Yeah, that could be an amazing secret that would be worth keeping. So. Uh, uh, well, a question I'd, I'd like to ask you, uh, Nigel, is uh, on uh, in, on vigilant uh, vigilant citizen. Uh, it reports that there's um, a actual um, what was it now? A pentagram. Google Earth discovered yeah. uh, over Russia, over Kazakhstan, a uh, a pentagram, massive, great big thing in Kazakhstan, in the Kazakhstan area. I I'm interested to to ask you: Have you done anything like that with with Google Earth and all that kind of thing, and seen any symbolism in the in the area from overhead, from from above, kind of thing? Anything odd? Yeah, I mean, this is the amazing thing is that when you look at that, I've seen what you're referencing there, Tony, myself, and I mean, it's just an amazing area. I mean, um, you know, to, for somebody to lay that down, it reminds you of the Nazca Lines, that type of thing on the scale of it. But yeah. it's, yeah, yeah, and it's obviously... Um, some people will look at that and see the connotations between occultism and, you know, that symbol. But you've got to really do the research. And we found that exactly the same here. Although we didn't find things of that nature in the landscape, you know, pentagrams and things, we do find energy lines that connect up to ancient sites that would form that type of um, symbolism. This is not a drill. I repeat, this is not a drill. This is not a drill. Do not be afraid. We are now in control of what you hear. One, two, three, testing. A journey to the far reaches of knowledge and the unknown. I can't believe I just saw that. From aliens to angels, conspiracies to cover-ups. One soul and preeminent power. From extraterrestrials to exposing the truth. I'll try to explain as much as I can. You're listening to Planet X. You're listening to Planet X. Planet X. This is Planet X. Planet X. Broadcasting to you from the studios of Planet X, this is The Tony Topic Show.
Bullshit conspiracies to cover ups. This is Planet X. Planet X online on your mobile. Well, good evening and welcome to the Tony Topping Show. We're back again. It's Tuesday. It's 8 p.m. It's Planet X. I've been down the lamb and flag. I've come back. And we've got Nigel Mortimer on the show. Nigel, who's going to give us an update on all his portal stuff and his excellent book that he's written and his public speaking. He was on the show a few months back. And this is part two, and I think he's had his computer hacked, and uh, I think there's all sorts to tell us. We've got an event coming up that he's roped us into, if I can yeah. get from the Lamb and Flag in time to settle. Uh, <laughs> and there we go. Good evening, <laughs> Nige. Hiya, Tony. How are you doing, I'm my all, friend? I'm all, I'm all right, mate. Yeah, Please. well, wait, you know, you can't be... The way that you set people up to start this show is unbelievable. I don't, I don't, you, you've lost your way, mate. Yeah, I've lost my way. Lost your I'm way. waiting. I'm waiting for the big broadcasting deal, so you know, so I can <laughs> set myself up and then call myself an Illuminati broadcaster. <laughs> exactly. And, you know, and give it the old eye symbol and uh, you know all that kind of jazz, mate. Is is what we're gonna do? It's, uh, well, I, I think you're in a prime position to actually be on this. Um, is it the the public voice or something? It's called the, oh, the David people's I, voice. Yeah, the well, people's voice. Yeah, 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 the, yeah, we'll, yeah I can we'll, see you on there, and I think it's well, well, yeah. It's, it's it's interesting to note that uh, you know more and more I uh, I see myself awakening with the world uh, with the world view around us. I mean Syria, I've never seen anything quite like it going on in Syria where they bomb the frigging place uh, right. in order to bring peace and freedom to the people. I find that very <laughs> sinister, very right. sinister in, indeed. And uh, also, what is sinister, of course, Nigel, is the targeting of researchers like ourselves who go down with illness, uh, who are absolutely mentally exhausted with our work, but still we still we trundle on against the court of public opinion that thinks we're absolutely mad uh you know and uh you've done uh, you've done lo loads of research and just to briefly bring the listeners up to date you wrote a book um called isaac newton and the, what is it the secret sun yeah the secret sundial the secret sundial and you wrote that and you've done all the research about freemasonry and settle and how it's covering up an esoteric uh, portal now if anybody thinks well nigel's talking out of his ass hat uh you need to look at the research of nick redfern he's only the research you would ever need and realize that the u.s military was also looking at this material in 1950 before the remote viewing programs of project stargate grill flame etc etc under, under the umbrella of something called the collins elite and they concluded roughly the same conclusion as I concluded before reading their info, probably as Nigel's concluded, and you've been followed by helicopters as well, Nigel, is that correct? Oh, yeah, I mean, it's all part of the course now, I mean, I've had the men in black experiences which um, I've recently described it's actually in the book, this, but it's all part of, you know, my previous work to actually discovering the portal in Settle, Tony right. but, yeah I mean, as you know, this doesn't just start with the portal. You know, I explained to your listeners last time about how these things go back to basically when I was born in Germany in 1959. Mm -hmm. um, uh, very strange things happening with my mother there, we, we, you know, which may be why, I don't know if this happened with you, Tony, but maybe why we're actually embroiled and involved 